Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. And of course, Andrew and Lindsay of uh, Dobra Tea Room may not be a uh, stranger to many of you in this room because I'm sure you have been, you have enjoyed, you've been in their space in downtown Asheville. Um, I'm truly honored to welcome Andrew and Lindsay here at UNCA today on a topic that's very close to my heart. Uh, as a person growing up in India, I have, um, you know, grew up with tea, uh, black tea, um, and so I'm really, um, and I'm, we are very fortunate to have Andrew. Andrew has traveled extensively in India, especially learning about the tea culture there, so we are very happy to have him and fortunate to have him and Lindsay, so please give them a very warm welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming out this morning. Um, beautiful day for tea, rain, you know, fills the outside air. And I know myself when I woke up this morning, kind of feeling the weather and everything, feeling like a warm chai would be a really wonderful thing to share with everybody today. So thank you. Um, a common greeting of hi, hello, or a friendship way of saying hello. And if everyone can follow me and say namaste this morning to each other, namaste, which is an Indian greeting to each person that means the light in me honors the light in you. So namaste, everyone. Um, today we will be sharing um, a little bit of a cultured experience through slideshow of uh, what I've learned in um, techniques of brewing tea and um, preparation and production of Darjeeling tea. Anyone here familiar with Darjeeling? Okay, a really high quality high mountain black tea. And we'll also be serving you a masala chai. Okay, those of you who like chai, we have a nice really authentic way of techniques of uh, a common recipe that we learned on our travels to share with you today too. So please enjoy. Um, Lindsay will be serving and preparing the tea and coming through and serving each person. So I wanna make sure that you have a cup to enjoy everyone. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, this is a wonderful picture here in South India. Um, in South India, um, the tea plant is uh, cultivated in the high mountains of uh, Nilgiri, the blue-green um, mountains in the province of Kerala. And um, as you can see, this was the, those of you who saw the flyer for this event, this was the, one of my favorite photos um, that I've taken in the South India. And um, the, the Indian women especially are my favorite to photograph just because of their skin and their outfits and, and their smiles and their happiness and whatnot. So it's really, um, I, I love this photograph and I'm happy to share this with you. Next slide, please. Um, here is the continent of what we call Mother India. <laughs> and um, as you can see, a very large um, uh, country here that's broken up into different provinces. And so on the very southern tip on the um, western side is Kerala, where the Nilgiri Mountains are. And um, up north on the um, eastern side is West Bengal. And Bengal is also where um, Ms. Kia is from, so I wanted to bring that to your attention too. And so this is where um, Darjeeling and Assam style teas are cultivated. And um, today we're going to talk about the differences in uh, the tea plant of Camellia sinensis and Camellia sinensis assamica that are native to this um, particular country. Next slide. So this here is a, um, a pluck of Darjeeling. Uh, that was cultivated in the springtime. Okay, we're gonna be sharing with you Darjeeling First Flush that was uh, cultivated in the spring. And as you can see, I just wanna point this out a little bit to you. This is the sprout or the first uh, tip of the springtime that sprouts. And um, they, um, they pluck this leaf um, in the springtime in about March. And as you can see, the bud or the tip of the tea plant, morning, um, is the highest point or the highest tip that's uh, sprouted in the springtime. And um, so what they do, the tea ladies, they come and pluck the leaves and uh, the one tip holds most of the caffeine or antioxidants from the tea. So as we know, um, the tea plant holds a lot of antioxidants, vitamins, vitamin C and whatnot. Excuse me, I'm really trembling at the moment. I apologize. <laughs> uh, my parents just walked in, hello. Thank you. I apologize. So here's the tea plant, Camellia sinensis. Um, and as we know, this is cultivated in the springtime. So the, um, the first sprout is what we call the flush of the spring sprout, okay? And um, the women pluck uh, the fine leaves with their, their thumbs. And um, women in India, you can see, are the ones that are harvesting the leaves because of their delicate fingers, okay? As you can see in the first slide that I shared with you, um, the, the women are the ones plucking the leaves, the men are the ones in the factory harvesting the leaves. 
Um, so this is Darjeeling first flush, and you can go to the next slide. And this is what we call Camellia sinensis asamica. Okay, so this is the other native uh, plant of Camellia sinensis that's uh, native to northern India, West Bengal, okay? And um, Assam, as you can see, it's a much larger leaf. It's a conical tree, okay? And as you know, that the um, slide that we showed you before is Camellia sinensis sinensis. Here we have Camellia sinensis asamica. So the Assam-style species of the tea plant is native to West Bengal, which is um, the northern part, northeastern. So this is where the um, really authentic, strong, bold, chocolatey chai tea comes from, okay? Do you wanna pass a around a little bit of the Darjeeling leaves too? Um, so Assamica was first um, discovered by um, two English men known as the Bruce brothers. And this was uh, the, the plant that's native to North India that they discovered in the 1800s. And um, as we know, China is the, the most you know, country that's native for tea and the number one um, producing uh, country that produces tea in the world. And India is the second largest country that um, produces tea in the world. So for export, I was speaking with Kia this morning about you know, enjoying tea and Indian tea. And um, she was saying that it was hard for her living in India when she was growing up, being able to taste Indian tea when she was little. So she'd come to America to visit and um, bring back tea to share with her family in India, which I thought was interesting. So Indians traditionally drink t chai or masala chai, okay? And so in this case, we're gonna share with you our masala chai, which is a blend of um, ginger, fennel, cinnamon, cardamom, and um, white pepper, okay? Which gives the tea a nice strength, bold kind of um, spiciness that balances with the Camellia sinensis asamica. Okay, next slide. So this is a picture of a lovely um, Bengali woman. As you can see, she's Hindi. And um, very, you know, traditional attire that she's wearing here, her basket on her head. So kind of the motion of plucking tea in India is the women wear the baskets on their head. And then um, when they're standing on the mountainsides, they're plucking the leaves and, you know, delicately placing them in their baskets behind them. So it's a really wonderful thing to witness and also, to, you know, to experience how they, you know, dance through the tea gardens and happiness and sing together and just really enjoy you know, their company of each other working. So the majority of the tea gardens that we um, source tea from, from Dobra, are fair traded. Okay, I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. So the laborers of the women that are working in these countries are paid fairly, okay? So we import tea directly from these particular tea estates that we visited annually. So um, someone from our country goes to India once a year and visits you know, the tea estates and um, we meet with our suppliers and tea gardens, you know, owners and whatnot, and taste the teas fresh um, throughout each season. So it's a really wonderful thing to experience. I was here in India in 2006. So next slide, please. And as you can see, here's the basket full of Darjeeling first flush, um, which again is the first sprout of the springtime. So I was here in May. And as you can see, it's a very delicate pluck of the leaves, very fine. You can see the leaves are very tidy, very beautiful, you know, all uniform together. And um, so the one bud to one leaf is the first sprout that is harvested in the springtime. And then if, is if anyone familiar with Darjeeling's second flush or the Himalayan harvest that we have? So they harvest Darjeeling three times a year. So spring, summer, and fall. Okay, so the tea that Lindsay's passing around to taste with you is the Darjeeling that's harvested in the springtime. Okay, so this was harvested last May, um, end of April into May. So um, Dobra will get the fresh um, Darjeeling har uh, first flush harvest in about a month and a half or so. So definitely look forward to that. So, um, but I was just explaining here that um, the leaves, you know, are very delicate this time of year. So as you can see, Lindsay's passed around the dried leaves as well. You can look down at it and even though it's a black tea, it's very green, it's very fresh, very young. So what I mean by flush, it's the first sprout. It's the first kind of growth in the beginning of the tea season. So Darjeeling is the one tea that always comes to us in the very beginning. So it's a really exciting time of year. So it's one of my favorites. Next slide, please. Um, this is a tea estate you see um, in Darjeeling. It's one really big giant mountain range that has um, tea gardens scattered all throughout it. And um, as you can see, this is a um, plantation um, estate symbol or sign. Um, but one of my favorite logos for a symbol of a company is the two hands in prayer and the tea leaf that's um, above, which symbolizes this particular um, company. So throughout Darjeeling, it's a very kind of touristy, smaller town, lots of really wonderful restaurants, authentic tea houses, you know, places to enjoy chai, all that good stuff. So um, I was in Darjeeling for about a week and every day I would go down, you know, the mountains to different hillsides and, you know, discover new um, tea plants and, and tea Darjeeling growing, so at different elevations. 
Um, and it was really nice to kind of pick one particular area of the mountain and kind of go explore down there and, you know, visit tea gardens and, and meet with owners and whatnot. So all throughout Darjeeling, this, the symbol for tea, if anyone decides to visit North India and see the tea gardens, definitely look for this big green symbol because it shows that tea is nearby. Um, here's again another um, picture of two lovely tea ladies harvesting tea in the springtime. This is from Margaret's Hope. Uh, Margaret's Hope is the oldest tea estate in India, and we have gotten some of our Darjeeling second flush from this particular estate. Um, so it was honored to um, visit this area because we'd been sourcing tea from this garden for many years and finally got to meet uh, myself with the owners and whatnot to experience the um, kind of the passion and the history of this particular garden that's been harvesting Darjeeling for many years. It's, you know, like I said, one of the oldest gardens there. So very happy tea ladies. Very big gardens here in India, you know, very... Um, Mountainous, as you can see, the women, as I mentioned, are standing on the hillside, and when they're plucking, their baskets are kind of headed up the mountain, so their, their motion of plucking is a way that they can kind of um, withhold the, the elevation for themselves when they're harvesting. I want to talk a little bit about the production of tea. Um, those of you who are um, familiar with green tea or white tea, oolong tea, puar tea, and in this case, we're drinking black tea, um, I want to share with you that all tea comes from the same plant, which is Camellia sinensis, okay? And um, can you go back to the second to the first slide? So this again is Camellia sinensis, okay? So this is a variety that's native to China. And in India, um, they cultivated or cloned um, this Camellia sinensis from China and brought this to North India. So they're preparing Darjeeling style leaves with clones of Camellia sinensis from China, okay? So what makes a green tea a green tea, a white tea a white tea, black or oolong, is really its oxidation process, okay? So it's the process in which the polyphenols or the free radicals of antioxidants and vitamins and that kind of thing come to the surface, okay? So we can go back to the Darjeeling production. So black tea is what we call fully oxidized, okay? The leaves are plucked by the beautiful ladies on the, in the tea gardens. And in this case, Darjeeling, um, again, is one of the most popular, you know, harvested for export and, and whatnot. So gardens here are very large. They're very um, big estates. And in this case, you can see these men are, you know, working with probably, I, I believe they produce about 50 pounds per day for about four months. That's just the springtime. So as you can see, the leaves are sitting out here on really large, um, long screens of which they're oxidizing. Okay, so oxidation means when um, the plant is plucked from the tea ladies, the moment the leaves are plucked, um, the juices or the oils of the tea plant start to come to the surface. Okay, this is actually a good thing. In this case, Darjeeling first flush is very muscatel. It's very, they call it the champagne of tea. So you get a lot of that kind of great floral qualities coming out here. Is anyone experiencing that right now in your cup a little bit? Very floral, not so bold, okay, tannic. It's another good way to describe Darjeeling. So this process in particular is really bringing out those tannins, okay? It's really bringing out those oils or that flourness to the surface. You can go to the next one. And this is just another photograph of, um, the oxidation beds of which forced air is, um, you know, underneath the screens of which uh, humidified controlled air is coming up through the screens to help them oxidize. Next slide. Okay, and then from the oxidation room, they come down into the tea factory in, in larger sacks. You can go to the next slide. And this is a very popular machine that you see in um, tea production. This is basically a giant mortar and pestle, okay, ways that you grind spices and herbs in your kitchen they're grinding or rolling tea in this particular case. So they're rolling it, which has a lot to do with its shaping, but again, bringing a lot of those juice, a lot of those tannins to the surface to bring out the muscatel magic, they call it, of, of Darjeeling. Next slide. And the woman is, um, again, once the final step in oxidation is uh, leaving the tea out to further oxidize one more time after it's rolled. So I must share with you the, the smell or the essence of the factory in this particular case. Again, tea is so fresh, it was just harvested in the morning. Lots of beautiful smells coming through here. I mean, it's just so aromatic and, and really wonderful. And as you can see, this is an organic estate, so the woman has you know, her particular um, clothing on to uh, cover from germs and whatnot. So this was an organic tea estate of uh, Margaret's Hope Factory. And um, so very, you know, very tedious work here. As you can see, they've got their chalkboard, they're paying attention to time and temperatures and that kind of thing. So there's really an alchemy to the processing of tea, especially Darjeeling. Um, as I shared with you, the, the Margaret Hope estate sign, um, each, each particular estate in Darjeeling, there's probably over 100 by now, is really trying to produce the best quality, the best tasting Darjeeling um, in that particular season. So it's really a competition, you know? So as I mentioned, when we 
harvest um, Darjeeling, I mean, sorry, when we import Darjeeling from India, um, we, we are able to choose and taste what particular lot or harvest we buy, which is really wonderful. So um, we get to taste many in the, in the springtime and whatnot. So this, in this particular case, this is one of the harvests that we decided to choose and bring home to Dobra and serve for you people in Asheville. Next slide, and this is just another picture I like to share just to explain a little bit about the qualities of Dober tea versus the qualities of Lipton tea. I'm sure all of you have had a Lipton tea bag before in your life. So um, this basically is one big giant cheese grater that's just rotating back and forth, and it's, um, it's sifting away the tips of the tea plant, the broken stalks of the tea plant, and also the dust, okay? So I like to say Dober gets the front pile, Lipton gets the right pile, okay? <laughs> Um, so very high quality tea here that they're producing, that's fine. And um, this is just a picture of a large dryer that um, dries the tea at the final stage of um, production. So really hot temperatures for a very short amount of time. So this machine is particular, kind of like, a, like the bagel toasters, you know, that you see in the cafes that just go and kind of toast the bagels and bring them right through. It's the same with tea. So um, we just bring it right through the dryer and it dries at really hot temperature for a very short time. And then we have our finished product that's floating around somewhere of Darjeeling. Um, this is a picture I wanted to share with you from um, our first day in India, our first day in Calcutta. Um, and this is what we call degustation or a tasting. Um, so in this case, we have all these different Darjeeling first flushes that are taste, um, you know, samples from all these different estates that I mentioned. So we got to taste here about 75 different Darjeelings our first day in India, which is really special. Does anybody have any questions at the moment right through the, through halfway through the slides or? Everybody enjoying the tea? Does anybody care to comment on the tea that you're tasting? Anybody? Mom? <laughs> oh, you didn't? oh, okay. It's coming. Lindsay's coming around, too. Make sure you guys get cups, too, that just came in. Cups, fine. Cool. <clears throat> so, again, what I wanted to share with you just about the culture of, of tea, uh, you know, through India and, and, and the differences of what they're producing is um, there's a very strong English fluence in the, um, in the culture of Darjeeling tea. So even though it's grown in North India, the really feel, the overall feel of English style tea and milk on the side and sugar and fancy cups and raising your pinky when you taste and all that really comes from that Western influence. Kia's laughing. Um, <laughs> so um, really comes from that Western influence. But I like to say that still in India, they're really enjoying tea traditionally. And it's important to, you know, really establish relationships of people that are really living their culture and really living um, their their, their product here that they're, you know, have become famous worldwide. Um, I know Germany is probably the second, um, you know, biggest importer of Darjeeling aside from America. Um, and then you have chai, which is really um, enjoyed by the casual tourist or the casual person that just needs their shot of espresso or their shot of coffee or their shot of chai, or in this case, Darjeeling. But chai is probably the most authentic um, way of drinking tea in India. Um, for those of you who didn't know, chai just means tea in translation. So chai means, you know, tea, whether it has milk or sugar or any type of, it's an infusion of camellia sinensis. So the word for chai in India is chai. Or word for tea in India is chai. Um, you can go to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about where chai comes from. Um, Lindsay will pass around the dried and the spice as well. This is in, um, up in uh, West Bengal as well. This is an Asamaka style garden. So as I shared with you on um, the, the second slide of the conical tree of Camellia sinensis asamica, um, this here is a very large tea estate that's grown in lower elevations. So as we're tasting right now Darjeeling first flush that's grown in the high mountains, this is actually lower elevation in the same province. And um, it's grown at really hot temperatures, so really hot, humid, moist. I remember being here and rhinoceroses and tigers are kind of hanging out. And um, so it's very raw, very aboriginal, wonderful experience in, in India. And so as you can see, as I was mentioning before, the very fine pluck of Darjeeling first flush, the one bud to one leaf, the delicacy of the woman plucking it. In this case, as you can see, this woman's got a big handful of, of leaves, so she's just kind of going for it. So in this case, we're taking a lot of the leaves that um, are harvested on the top, which is the tips, which will give us the caffeine and antioxidants, but a lot of leaves that follow further down the plant, which gives the chai or the tea more body, more strength, which holds up to milk or spices or sugars and that kind of thing. So this particular um, style of asamaka is just plucked, you know, at random and then harvested and oxidized in a similar way of what I shared with you with Darjeeling. Next slide. And this is a, a photograph of the, um, the asamaka tea garden. 
And um, as you can see, very large bushes, you know, not mountainous at all, very hillside. When we were here, there's lots of children around. Again, that whole kind of family collective spirit of the, of the Indian way. And um, lots of families hanging out, you know, kids riding bikes through the gardens, um, the women plucking the leaves. Go to one more slide. So this is a photograph I wanted to share with you of all of us um, from our company in Assam. I could share that at the end, but um, just to share with you again, lots of tea ladies, lots of tea pluckers and, um, you know, the children hanging out. But I want to share with you the story of when we were there, we were so, um, you know, being Westerners and photographing and tasting teas here. Um, this, this particular garden was really producing tea in, in mass quantity. So um, these women work really hard throughout the day and again, in a fair trade manner. Um, but we were there and we took away about probably one or two hours of their work just because we were walking through the gardens, photographing them and talking to them. And really a digital camera in a foreign country or third world country can really make you a best friend. So highly recommend photographing these, these types of experiences. Um, but I want to share with you that when we were there, um, you know, we took away actually two hours of these um, women's day of work. So we actually had to pay as a group or a company for the work that was lost in that particular day. So we shared, you know, some of our rupees in that case um, to the, the gardener the, or the tea um, estate owner to be able to hang out and have a good time with this, these, these families and, and all the ladies. So as you can see, everyone is smiling and celebrating their day and their families and culture. So it's a really nice experience here in Assam. Very hot. So we'll go back like four or five other way. Sorry. Okay, so this again is the Assam estate. You can go next. Um, so this, I love this picture of um, the export warehouse in um, Calcutta. So I mentioned in West Bengal, the um, city of Calcutta is one of the oldest cities in India. And um, for those of you who have been to Dobra Tea Room, you can see these are large chests of which tea is exported in. Um, so these are large handmade wooden chests that are stamped by a particular garden or estate of the variety of um, tea that's coming to being exported. Um, so here's a happy little kid just kind of hanging out in the factory when we were there. And um, so we use these particular boxes as tables in the tea room for sometimes. I know a lot of our customers have wanted to buy them because they're really authentic and it's really nice that they're still, um, you know, using this, this particular method that's, you know, been happening in Darjeeling and Assam for many years. So I'm really, uh, you know, celebrating the elements of the earth here, you know, with tea being exported and using kind of pieces of the lands that still we get a piece of India when that chest arrives um, to the tea room. So it's really nice to keep that, that table alive. So, you know, as I mentioned, when Darjeeling arrives to us in April in the springtime, um, it's, this is the best part of, you know, opening that, that chest and really smelling that aromatic muscatel um, spring harvest. So this is a really exciting moment. So as you can see, he's pretty psyched about, you know, his family's tea leaving um, the estates. So Lindsay's got a little bit more Darjeeling coming around for those of you. Can we have a show of hands who haven't gotten tea over here, maybe this side? Did you guys get tea in the back? Good, okay. Okay, and some people on the floor, okay. Thank you all again for coming out this morning. It's a great group. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about chai. Um, so as you can see, this is a picture of a man in a really um, just simple street style um, stall. They call, they call them chai wallas. Anybody familiar with a chai wala? Anybody seen um, Slumdog Millionaire? I think there's a couple Chaiwala shots in there as well. Um, so Chaiwalas are really famous people. They're really um, well-known kind of street characters in India throughout the streets that are really loud and hustling, bustling. And I know for myself when I was in India, it's really, it's sensory overload. You know, you've got curry smelling, you've got tea brewing, you've got an elephant walking by you, you've got someone trying to sell you something. You know, so India is really alive. It's really cultured. You have fabrics, you have bangles, you know, like people trying to sell you all these wonderful traditional crafts. but here you come upon a beautiful, um, simple chai stall, of which I'm, of course, excited because being a tea lover and just kind of see their method of preparation. Um, so I want to share with you that chai is really um, is a cooked recipe. It's not just something that you throw in a tea bag and put your hot water in and here we go. Or for those of you who've had you know, tea in traditional just American cafes of using concentrates and diluting that with milk and sugar and here's your chai. So the chai that we serve at Dober is very authentic in this same way of just kind of overseeing or looking over this man's shoulder when we were in India and really discovering their recipe of traditions of um, preparing chai. 
Um, so he's basically got his little stovetop here of hot water. He's using milk, um, the Assam style black tea that's being passed around with the spice. And um, some chai, and it depends on where you are in India, some family recipes have a little bit more spice to them. And some really only use the black tea, the Assamica with um, milk and sugar and cardamom. Okay, those of you familiar with cardamom, that's the number one spice that really brings out the, um, the traditions in chai. Um, so as you can see, he's pouring chai really high back and forth. He's brewing it, he's aerating it. And um, this is a really kind of amazing technique that they have of really cooking the tea back and forth and rotating the milk and the sugar so it balances itself. Excuse me. And um, so, no, this is fine. Um, so for those, has anyone been to India here? Okay, a couple people. Are you familiar with chai? Garam chai. Okay, that's the call for chai. Okay, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so to share with you a chai experience, this is the hustling bustling of a, of a train station in India, okay? Um, quite an experience. I, I took trains all over India and really hearing that call of chai, garam chai, garam means um, hot. And um, so when you're in the train stations, um, basically a lot of people are just, you know, again, trying to get hustle and bustling, moving their children around and everything. But you hear the chai call and that's when it's really alive. There's so many sounds, sensor, sensory overload and all that good stuff. So. Um, I remember being on the trains and really, you know, trying to fall asleep and men are still running up and down the, the aisles of the, of the train station and in the train screaming chai, you know, so of course you want to taste it because it's authentic and it's an experience. So um, I just wanted to share with you, you know, the photos and the experiences of a train station because it's, it's quite the experience, you know, just taking the train in India for those of you who, who end up getting there sometime, I highly recommend, you know, experiencing that and putting yourself through that. Um, so this is just traditional train stops and um, chai Wallace walking around doing his thing, cooking the chai, walking around with pots that Lindsay will soon be walking around with, um, of pouring chai and selling it for one rupee, which one rupee is about, what, 30 cents here in America? About, so very, very cheap. So um, one rupee chai, sure, all day long. So um, definitely enjoying plenty of those in my, in my journeys. You can go to the next slide. I just want to talk about Lord Ganesh a little bit and um, how he influences my life and also influences the Hindu culture in India. Um, Ganesh in particular is the, um, the elephant god, okay, who removes obstacles, removes stress. Um, I've always associated with him with kind of the solar plexus or the digestion kind of stomach god. And for those of you who've been to Dover, we have a very large Ganesh that sits in our front room. And um, he's very important for me around tea because he really, again, rules that health quality or that aspect of, you know, the digestion and that kind of thing. For those of you who've seen statues when he's holding the sweet or the ladu in his hand, um, ladus are always served with chai, so they'll be like coconut or sesame kind of little, little treats. So in Indian culture, they always drink um, chai and have some type of biscuit with it, like shortbreads or, in this case, ladus and whatnot. So... Um, chai, you know, is, is enjoyed by all different religions and faith in India. Um, but this in particular was um, a Ganesh that I saw at a tea um, estate that was more Hindu based. So he is a Hindu god. And um, so I just really appreciate him being that ruler of, you know, medicine and authenticity of, of Hindu culture. And um, he's definitely prayed for for the removing of obstacles and all that good stuff. So I just wanted to share this picture with you because it was a little kind of alcove or archway of had a little temple for Ganesh right below this tea garden. So I, I really enjoyed that experience. This is just another picture of a beautiful tea lady harvesting tea. This is us and Assam together as a group. And this is one of, you know, just the oldest um, picture that's part of Dobra Company. This is, again, the one bud to two leaf ratio. So this was a picture that was taken in the summertime um, for Darjeeling's second flush. Um, so you can go back to that. <clears throat> so again, just reflecting back to the plant of Camellia sinensis for those of you who came late, um, as you can see, there's the small needle or the shoot, that's the tea tip that holds a lot of the antioxidants, um, polyphenols, caffeine, flavor, and whatnot that gives tea really its medicinal or health properties. And then the leaves that follow further down the plant um, give the tea a lot more backbone or body. So those of you who are familiar with like silver needles, white tea, or very tippy, delicate green teas, um, silver needles white tea, for instance, is unoxidized, so therefore it has a, an abundance of tips, so it will have um, a lot of, you know, caffeine, but a lot of antioxidants. I know white tea right now is really big on the health market. And of course, in the Ayurvedic world or health world, Ayurveda is the um, Indian way of health, um, using, you know, doshas and whatnot to um, balance kind of each person's constitution. I know that chai can be very tridoshic. 
Um, so which means, you know, the heat of the spice or the cooling of different spices can really kind of, you know, balance your body's inside and make you feel good. But then the black tea that's, of course, in with the spice um, will give, you know, it a little bit more of a backbone or ginger kind of burn in your throat. So Lindsay's passing around the um, masala chai. And masala means, sp masala means spice mix or blend of herbs. Um, so in this case at Dobra, our masala mixes ginger, cinnamon, fennel, uh, white pepper, and cardamom. And then our masala spice, we brew a very strong concentrate and uh, infuse that into the Assam style black tea. So uh, traditionally it is served with milk or cooked with milk, but I decided not to do it with milk today, just based on people's you know, dietary needs and whatnot. So um, feel free to definitely come to the tea room and enjoy the masala as well and chai. Um, and then when you order chai chai at Dobra, we um, do it the same street style way of cooking the recipe like the chai wallas. So that's good. I wanna ask if anyone has questions or Let's comments. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, if anyone has questions about tea or about India or anything like that, yes? Can you like explain kind of how they cook it on the street? How they cook it on the street? Yeah, so you use, um, and do you want to go back to that picture of the chaiwala? So you use just like a traditional saucepan, you know, like a small saucepan, and you're using the, um, did those leaves make it around to you? The, is, are the tea masala and the black tea still being passed around? They're in the back, I think, so you can show that. Um, so you use this particular variety of uh, what we call CTC, which is crushed, torn, and curled leaves of, um, of Asamaka, and it looks like little pellets, okay? So that tea in particular is very bold. It's, very, it's got a really rich kind of chocolatey flavor. So what we're going to do is like make a really strong what you call decoction. You're, so you're actually decocting the tea rather than just brewing it with hot water and taking it away from the water. And um, so we're making a decoction of the Asamaka tea on the stovetop and cooking that. Um, as you can see, he's got the, the small saucepan on the side, and what he's doing is just aerating his milk right now, of which then will go into the um, decoction of the milk, I'm sorry, of the tea and the water, and then sweeten it very um, sweetened with, with sugar. In this case, we use um, organic sugar. We, we make our chai very authentic, but most Americans that come to the tea house, they really want half the amount of sweetener because it is like quite the explosion of, of sweetness, you know, like tingle your teeth kind of sweet. So, um, so cooking the black tea, adding the milk and sugar to taste, and then once that comes to a boil, you strain that into your clay cup and we dust it with cardamom. That's really nice. And uh, another way of, auth of authentically preparing chai, you know, as I mentioned, throughout India, each family or different provinces have um, different recipes based on their family's tradition. So some will throw masala in with the tea that's decocting on the stove and um, brew that way. So, question? Yes? Have ever thought about cultivating tea in Africa or even in Dobra? I'm sorry? Have you ever thought about making tea or growing tea in, in Dobra at Asheville area? Are, is anyone cultivating tea? Or have you thought about it? Have we thought about it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, as you know, weather's changing kind of all over the world, global, global warming, if you want to call that. Um, I, myself, Lindsay, and I have some tea plants at our house in our yard. Um, so we're growing Camellia sinensis sinensis, but I strongly feel that you know, with the weather changing and Asheville kind of you know, being a subtropical humid climate, it is ideal for tea and tea growing. Um, I think our winter is a little bit harsher compared to like winters in India or winters in South Asia, Southeast Asia. So um, the winter is the one kind of season that I would worry about, you know, as far as tea plants may be dying. I know ours aren't looking so great right now, but in the springtime, I pray that they come back, you know. Um, but that's a good question. A lot of people ask us that. And there are days when I'm inspired of, you know, our, our particular yard at home is kind of terraced, you know, which is really ideal for kind of that mountainside or hillside kind of tea growing. So I've always had this inspiration of like, hey, maybe let's plant six or 10 of them here and see what happens. So um, I'm honored to be able to travel to these countries. For instance, you know, processing Chinese green tea is a lot simpler than the slideshow that I just shared with you, of you know, uh, fully oxidizing black tea. Chinese green tea is just plucked and then it's pan fried, you know, just like in a wok, not with like oils or anything. So it's kind of cooked, kind of, you know, similar to stir fried vegetables. So I feel like if we were able to get um, tea thriving throughout the spring and summer, if we were to be able to pluck the tips and the leaves and we could actually make some type of North Carolina local infusion. <laughs> yeah, that local word. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Have you, is it possible to grow tea underground in a controlled environment? 
I don't think so. I think sun is definitely definitely important for um, the leaves to grow and thrive. Um, in, J in Japan, for instance, um, there are a couple shade-grown teas. Um, and when you grow tea in the shade, it really helps um, produce a lot of chlorophyll and even more nutrients for the, t for the tea plant. Um, and then, you know, so for instance, this particular variety of shade grown or dark style Japanese teas um, is shaded for about three months. And then right before um, the week of harvest, they take the screens off of it and expose it to sun. Therefore, it, you know, thrives immediately. And um, so the plants really fight for that kind of nutrients or the sun. And then, oh, wait, there's the sun. Here we go. So um, that uh, it could be possible, but it all depends on, you know, climate and Humidity and what humidity is a really important factor in tea. Um, just to share with you, there is a tea garden um, similar to the Asamaka style garden in Charleston, South Carolina, um, right outside of Charleston, kind of between Charleston and Beaufort, and they're growing, um, cultivating Camellia sinensis Asamaka. Um, so it was cool to visit there and a lot of the same, you know, machines that I shared with you, they're using actually, they imported from India. So they're traditional Indian style, you know, tea harvesting machines. Um, but a lot of the tea that's being produced there is unfortunately dust for bags or they, you know, grind it really small. So they wouldn't sell us like a, a bag of what you call orthodox style tea, which is full leaf tea before it's crushed or, you know, torn or curled. Is that an Indian term or what you call orthodox tea? Do you know? Okay. That's what they say in Assam. They say orthodox or do you want this, you know, the crush? So, um, so I highly recommend anyone this summer, if you're down there visiting that tea garden in Charleston, it was pretty, it was nice. So. Yes. Can you explain the oxidation process again? Sure. Yeah. Um, do you want to go back a couple of slides? Yep. So again, the first um, step in oxidizing what we call fully oxidized black tea. You can go back to maybe the tea lady. It's, you can stop here. Yeah. Um, so plucking the leaves, of course, first, very delicate fingers. The women pluck the leaves. In this case, one bud to one leaf. Next slide. Um, so I, as I mentioned, the, um, as soon as the leaves are plucked, the oils or the oxygen is exposed to the plant's cell structure, so it's actually living. So the oils and the aromatics and the juices of the tea plant are coming to surface. Um, so in this case, we're fully oxidizing the tea, so it's going to sit out on these what we call withering beds for about four to six hours um, in the early afternoon, of which this is when the, the oils and the juices start to get really... Um, um, juicy, you know, for those of you who've harvested, you know, fresh peppermint or any type of herbs in your, in your gardens, if you end up drying them, you know how the tea kind of gets like wet first and, and, um, wilted in a way. That's what's happening here with the tea. Next slide. And then, um, this is just forced air underneath the beds, which isn't super necessary, but you see this a lot in India. And then next slide. This is a process of, um, rolling. So big giant mortal pestle in this case. Um, of rolling the leaves, helping those juices, wringing the leaves out, kind of helping the juices come to the surface even more. And this is the shaping process. So the Darjeeling, as we passed around, is like kind of small little S-shaped leaves. This is what's happening here. Next slide. And then one more further oxidation. So what we saw in that first step, it's going to sit out again and expose to oxygen and oils even more, okay, before it's dried. This is the sifting of the leaves. Dobra gets the tips, Lipton gets the dust. Next one. <laughs> and uh, the dryer, really high heat at, um, for a very short amount of time. So uh, withering, oxidizing, and drying really are the, withering, rolling, oxidizing, and drying are the four main steps. Are those just different amounts of time for different kinds of tea? Different yeah. kinds of tea. Um, so I can just talk a little bit about that. So um, to talk about the family of Camellia sinensis, and again, what makes each, each style of tea its style of tea, um, green tea, I'll just go through the, the broad spectrum. Green tea is what we call unoxidized. So the leaves are plucked. And in this case, we're not going to oxidize it or wither it. So we're going to heat it immediately to stop that process. So in China, they pan fry the leaves, similar to wok style. And um, in Japan, they steam the leaves. So for those of you who've had Japanese tea, you know, green tea that's served at sushi restaurants, really kind of fishy and salty and oceanic. This has a lot to do with the steaming process. And then it's dried. So green tea is unoxidized. White tea is what you call lightly oxidized, so it's plucked and withered in that um, particular um, style of um, beds or on bamboo screens in China, and then they immediately dry it after that process. Oolong tea is right in the middle between green and black tea, um, so what you call semi-oxidized. And you have oolongs that are greener, a little bit closer to green teas, more floral, high mountain oolongs that grow in Taiwan and China. 
and then you have darker or baked uh, oolongs that grow in the northern part of China. And so the um, process of the green ones is similar to the withering and what's happening with the rolling with the mortar and pestle, but they use these, um, what you call drum layer that kind of look like clothing dryers at home. And um, it's tossing the leaves, helping them curl, and then they take fabric and really wring the tea out and bring all those juices to the surface. Therefore, for those of you who've had the rolled style oolong or Chinese tea ceremony um, oolong, that is, um, ideal for many infusions. So in this case, you know, Lindsay can only really brew the Darjeeling one time. If you brewed it again the second time, it's not gonna really taste that well. Oolongs are known to be able to um, be brewed for many times throughout the afternoon. And then baked oolongs are the similar process, but they um, go in um, kind of like open fires underneath. And then you'll have um, the bamboo steaming baskets from China that will sit on top of the fire and basically bake the tea. Um, you have black tea, which is um, fully oxidized, what I explained. And then has anyone tasted puar tea before? Puar, yeah. Puar is what you call um, fully oxidized, twice fermented, okay? So um, puar is a four-month oxidation process similar to compost that is plucked and kept at a humidified controlled room um, for about four months. And similar to compost, as you, you know, crank your compost turner and you're making soil, um, it's the same way that they do with this particular tea. Um, so it withers and then stays in like kind of uh, raised bed looking piles um, and covered with tarps. And then once a week, they'll spray the tea and then rotate it again. So as you know, when you're composting tea or it's, you know, fermenting, the warmest part of that particular pile is the center. So it's almost like creating an oven. So once a week, they'll take the tarps off and then toss the tea so it evenly oxidizes and then it's dried. So that is basically the spectrum. So it's important to understand that all tea is Camellia sinensis. Um, in this case, I shared with you Camellia sinensis asamica, which is the other species of Camellia sinensis. Um, but um, really the oxidation process is, is what, you know, come, I mean, makes each tea its particular tea. So does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Any other questions about India tea? Yes, sir. Well, you may have answered this at the very beginning. So it's originally a Chinese or, origin. So Camellia sinensis is native to China. Okay, it's native to Yunnan, China, which is the southern province. And this is where the, um, the Zishuangbana jungle is, where the oldest tea tree is of about, I'd say, 2,700 years old. Um, I went to that particular tree when I was in Yunnan, which was quite the pilgrimage for a tea lover, which was awesome. And not something that you find in, you know, your Lonely Planet guide or anything like that. It was really some, something that was off the beaten path that was really um, amazing to discover. So that the oldest Camellia sinensis tea plant is known um, from Yunnan. And then in West Bengal in um, northern India, northeast India, was when um, in 1876, two um, Englishmen, they're, they're named the Bruce brothers, discovered um, the Asamaka tea variety. Okay, so. Growing there, or they, they brought it there? Growing there, actually. Growing. Yes, and then um, the Camellia sinensis Chinese style variety of tea plant was cloned to Darjeeling. So that area of northern India, West Bengal, and, and cultivated you know, by clones, okay? So they're actually Chinese bushes that ended up there hundreds of years ago that are now in Indian soil producing Darjeeling. So was it part of Indian culture before the, the British found it there? I mean, they found it growing there or they, they then- I don't believe it? so, no. I think really when Asamaka was first discovered was when the infusion of chai, which is milk and sugar and, you know, Asamaka black tea was first kind of, oh, how are we gonna infuse this? What's gonna happen? Let's make something out of it and see, and I know the processing techniques of these fancy machines and everything is really something that comes with technique. You know, I was here in 2006, and I can guarantee that like these methods are changing. You know, we're going to Japan in May, and I, I'm just excited to see like, okay, what's happening now? Like what new machines are they using? And that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I really think that Asamaka, you know, then was kind of um, based on it being a camellia. I think the Indians already knew that this plant was being cultivated in China, therefore, there was some type of infusion to be made from it. So, good. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Thank you all so much for coming. Oh, question, yeah. <laughs> yes. I did have a question. Oh, please, can yeah. I, so, um, you can do a thank you again. What do you think, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> What's the, what's in your opinion, the effects of globalization on the tea culture of India and China and Japan? Yeah, do you see it changing? Yeah, I do see it changing. Um, tea, I think, is really, um, 
I don't want to say it's at its peak, but I know for I've been with tea now for 11 years, and I think that tea is really starting to become this worldwide, world-known thing. You know, every day someone comes in the tea house. Oh, I'm trying to get off coffee. I want to start drinking tea. Oh, I want to, you know, so I want to get into this, and and I'm I'm here today to kind of educate everyone on what what's actually really happening in this tea world. You know, of like what makes the tea the tea kind of thing. So. Um, I think that um, you're starting to see a lot more mass produced, produce, produce kind of tea gardens in these particular countries. As I mentioned, China is, you know, the number one um, mother country, mother China, if you want to call it, of tea. So China is the motherland of tea. And I know China is, um, when I was there um, visiting our gardens that we get tea from, you know, which are organic, I didn't see a lot of pesticide use, but I know from experience of going to tea markets and just buying tea from the random person on the street or some family shop, there is a lot more pesticides being used in chemicals. Um, and I'm, I'm sad to see that, you know, so that kind of the, the pesticides, pesticides, you know, being sprayed on the tea plants to produce more. Um, I think that's affecting, you know, the climates of these, you know, particular tea growing areas. But I also think that it's, you know, pesticides in tea, you can really taste it, you know. And um, just randomly at Dober, we'll get a package in the mail someday, and it's some samples of teas from China. And it's just like, oh, try our tea. This is my family's garden. And, you know, and you can just open it up and smell it. So that's really the differences that I'm noticing, just a lot more kind of not very skilled people knowing what they're doing, but like, oh, tea's really big. Let's get into the tea market and, and trying to get a piece of that, you know. For instance, you know, explaining Margaret's Hope, the oldest tea garden in India, I know that they're really sticking to their traditions of organics and, you know, producing, um, you know, leaves traditionally from their plants that have been producing tea for hundreds of years. So um, I'm sure, I mean, I was in organic gardens in India that were really dirty and really not so clean. And then I was, you know, in other organic gardens that were wonderful and sparkly and, you know, the tea plants, you can just look at them and tell that they're healthy and alive and other ones that are kind of browner and kind of grown over there in the mountains and not, you know, you have to have that ideal climate. That's why I'm scared to grow tea in Black Mountain, you know, because I don't know if it's going <laughs> to, if it's going to happen, it'd be a good experience. But um, there's more and more um, difficulties with importing and exporting that I'm experiencing a little bit now. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we travel annually to these tea countries. So each year, twice a year, we do, you know, an importing directly to Asheville, which is um, a really wonderful thing to be able to offer to our community here in Asheville of, you know, really direct farm to table relationships and, you know, doing my sourcing in the springtime. So tea is really being harvested next month. That's Darjeeling is the beginning of the season. And um, I'm seeing a lot more challenges with importing these days, you know, just like FDA regulations and who made this tea, what's their registration number, you know, so each tea that I import, I have to, you know, really show the gov show the FDA or the government where it's coming from, how it's produced, is it organic, how much it weighs, how much it costs, here it comes, you know, and then you pay duties on it and then you pay taxes on it, so even though the Boston Tea Party in the 1700s in Boston was all about the no tax on tea that lasted a little while, but we have, we have tax in North Carolina, so. But Vermont, for some reason, that was where I'm, I'm from, where I had the tea house, there wasn't a tea tax. So we were always like, Boston Tea Party, you know? Um, but now they're in North Carolina, there is a tax on tea. So I just wanna to say too, for um, you know, those of you who haven't visited our tea room, we're downtown on Lexington Avenue. Um, 78 North Lexington Avenue is our address, and we open at 9 in the morning. We're open until about 10 p.m. during the week, and um, close to um, open on the weekends till about 11. And um, we serve teas from all over the world and authentic tea wares and, you know, traditional methods of preparing. Um, so it's really an experience, you know, like offering those traditions of not only chai and masala and darjeeling, but, you know, offering green tea and puar and everything that I explained in a traditional manner. It's, it's really an honor to kind of share that experience with our customers and, you know, our community. So... Please come check us out. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody take home Namaste with them. Namaste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much.